Hey, it's Samantha Hartley of the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. This is season four, our last episode of season four, and it is about networking. I couldn't close out a season about marketing without talking about this topic. And I am crazy excited because I got the OG on the topic of networking, Susan Rowan, to speak with me today. Because we identify as shy or introverted, 90% of adults find a room full or a Zoom full of strangers to be daunting. If you've ever felt that way, you are not alone. That's one reason Susan Rowan's classic bestseller, How to Work a Room, has sold over 1.2 million books in 14 countries. I have it on my shelf. Her book, What Do I Say Next, was also a bestseller. Named by Forbes.com as one of the networking gurus, uh, Susan is an in-demand and virtual international keynote speaker who has shared her message of connecting and communicating with audiences worldwide. She's been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, on CNN, the BBC, all those kinds of places. Uh, She was also quoted by Sir Richard Branson in his 10 Quotes to Mark Things Happen as his number six. Uh, Her clients include Coca-Cola, My Old Place, the U.S. Air Force, where my father was, the United Healthcare Group, Yale University, Apple Computer, you get the idea. Oh, and her personal favorite, Hershey Chocolate. Uh, Please join me in welcoming to the podcast my guest, keynote speaker, bestselling author, and the mingling maven, Susan Rowan. Susan, I wanted to open by telling you my uh, most jaw-dropping networking story, and then we can refer back to it. And I would love to hear your most jaw-dropping networking story. Um, Mine was several years ago, I was um, living in Arkansas, where I'm originally from. It's the middle of the country, tons of small business there. And I was invited to a Christmas party. And uh, like a lot of people, I have mixed feelings about networking. So I walked into this party and I knew a couple of people there, but I mostly didn't know anyone. And I was like a little bit dreading it and a little nervous. And I decided to do this thing I call pinball networking, which is when I just go like a pinball from people I know to people I know to people I know. And I was walked over to some people I knew and they introduced me to the man that they were speaking to. Um, and he said, well, what do you do? And I gave him my, my answer to that question. And he said, well, come see me on Monday. I went to see him on Monday. And within a few days, I had a $44,100 um, engagement, consulting engagement. So that is my fastest return um, and biggest return on a networking, um, in a networking situation. So I would love to hear your takeaways on that and your favorite networking story. Well, interestingly, I'm going to separate out. Networking is different than working a room. A lot of people think they're the same thing, they are not. Knowing how to work a room is having social skills, which obviously you have, even if you apply it to business. And it's how we mix and mingle and introduce ourselves to people and introduce them to each other. And that's the socializing. The networking, the really actual networking is the follow-up that we do. So that, because here's the other thing, Samantha, you could have said, oh, fine, and not called and not shown up. So that kind of follow-up, once you go to that event, that's where the magic lies. In fact, when I started to write Secrets of Savvy Networking, my second and still my favorite book, um, I came up with, if the cards you got when you worked a room and you put in your pocket, go to the cleaners in your jacket, you're a one night stand. So we (laughs) want to prevent the one night stand offish and stand onish. So it's really about the follow-up. So there are two separate skills. I can prove it because I wrote two separate books, no repetition. Because people need to know, how do you walk in the room? I love your pinball because that's really, you go to the people you know. They'll introduce you to other people. But I'm going to give everyone a tip. Here's another thing to do. Because 90% of us self-identify as shy, according to research at Philip Zimbardo, who started, co-started the Stanford Shyness Clinic, if you will go into a room, which is how to work a room, if you go into a room and look for the people standing alone. I know a lot of people think, oh, I want to talk to the person with the best title and the person with the most expensive look yeah. and the person yeah. who forget that. You never know who the four flushers are. And if you don't know what that word means, look it up and you'll look it up and you'll go, gosh, I know a whole bunch of people that are four flushers. They got nothing, but they dress like a million. Mm -hmm. And then there's some people 
as someone explained to me, a client, when I worked for one of the major accounting firms and I saw someone not wearing a suit, but wearing an alpaca sweater. And I made a judgmental comment. The managing partner said, because they were my client, he said, Susan, don't judge him by the way he's dressed. He isn't a client. We would kill to have him a client. He was one, of, I live in the San Francisco area. He said, he was one early in this Silicon Valley game. He doesn't have to dress for success because he is one. Mm -hmm. So I've learned, don't be fooled. You could go down to Beverly Hills and see someone in jeans and think, oh, in jeans. And then you find out they cost $500. Yeah, right. They have Swarovski crystals in the belt buckle. Yeah. So a couple of lessons here. Before you're going to an event, like you have a strategy. It's the, act like a pinball. Yep. Um, it. The other thing is be prepared. So you know you're going to an event, what kind of event, who might be there? And this also applies online. Oh, for goodness sakes, I don't care if you read curated news or just get your news, get it from a fact-based source, of course, but come in and know what's going on in the world and know what happened at the Golden Globes, what happened at the, you know, at the last uh, Super Bowl. What I know I watched it for the commercials and tried to get a vaccine appointment during the game. That's what I do. <laughs> right. And I'm still topical. <laughs> yeah, still still very so many topics of discussion just in what you just shared there. So I'm going to stop and just say to everyone, do you see what I just did? Yeah. I used what this old English, former English teacher, I used a couple of dependent clauses uh -huh. and prepositional phrases and threw in a couple of things. Because I know I'm not the only one that watches the Super Bowl for the commercials. Um, but I also threw in something current that I tried to get a vaccine appointment, mm -hmm. which people are doing for themselves, for their parents, for their neighbors. You know, it's a big topic of everyone's discussion now. So what you do is you go into any room or go on a Zoom, be aware of what's going on in the room. Can I quote my fifth grade teacher? Please. Mrs. Kurtz said that in order to be a good conversationalist, you have to be well in, um, you have to be well informed. And then she said, to be well informed, you must be well read. And then you'll have something to talk about. Samantha, I don't have pets. Uh -huh. But if someone has a beautiful golden. So do my friend, Ann and Lana. I talk about Henry and Pi. Um, if someone has a kitty and I'm not a cat person, I talk about Daisy, my friend mm -hmm. Becky, you know. So we can borrow parts of people's lives. Please write that down. That's in, yeah. what do I say next? Borrow other people's lives. I don't have kids. My friends tell me stories. They're in tears. I'm laughing my head off. Mm -hmm. And then I say, oh, that's so funny. Can I put that in a book? Can I tell that to other people? Mm -hmm. Listen to what people say. They give you the punchlines yeah. of life. And nobody it. gets insulted if you say, oh, my God, you're so funny. That's so witty. Who gets insulted by that? I don't think anyone. So what I so, love uh, and um, and wonder about what uh, you're sharing are examples of ways that we can bond with strangers. Uh, and I think the problem is that people feel compelled to um, make a business connection or, you know, make a worthwhile connection. Um, one of the things I, that I talk about all the time is when people say, I don't want to go into that meeting because it's just going to be a chamber and there'll be all these terrible people. And I'm like, it's so easy for you because go in and then you just look around the room and look for your people. Like I can find my people at a chamber meeting because I know who my people are. Um, and it's not that they're going to be, you know, dressed in funky clothes or, or wearing a big hat with um, lights on it. It's like, I, I recognize my people. And so if I see someone and I don't feel like a connection spark, I don't even bother having a conversation with them. But as you're saying, when 
we get to talking about dogs or other people's kids or those things like that. And I feel this, this spark, um, that's likelier to be someone that I want to be connected to, whether it turns into anything or not. So how do you help people understand that, uh, how to create relationships that will be beneficial later? Like, do they want to go make five new friends that might not have any business relevance for them? Well, you know, that's a personal thing. See, sometimes you walk into a room and it's business. And I've done it so many times where I've met someone and it's about business. And then we found, and this is the key, we were laughing together at the same thing. Folks, if you want to know who your people are, they are the people with whom you laugh. Because I had it the other way. There was someone in my life and I, I think I'm funny. So, and this person never laughed at what I thought I was being funny. But when I was being dead serious, that person laughed. And I go, oh, we're going to Marie Kondo that person. No, <laughs> no, no joy spark there. No way. <laughs> um, but, but I hope my, you may have seen my eyes rolling. When people walk into a room to say, who can I talk to that I can sell to? Don't do that because if you walk into any room whether it's social because i've spoken to singles groups on how to work a room if you have an agenda it's like on yeah. your forehead and it makes us run away from you i would like to suggest that we do the homework to know the theme who might be there what would be their issues? If you're in your own chamber group, you all belong to the same community. There are people in different professions. You might not do business with them, but you may have a neighbor who says, you know, I'm looking for a graphic artist. And you go, you know, I just met a great person. I saw some of their work at the chamber. And you become, I know today they call it the connector. I'm old school. I call it, you're the matchmaker. You match make, you put people together. I joined a BNI years ago, partially because I just, uh, giving referrals didn't come naturally. I felt like I didn't have the part of the brain that went, oh, I just thought of someone. And over the years, I kind of worked to make that happen. But I had thought for a long time that, that referral givers were born and not made. Do you find that people are, you know, that you can become more of a connector? Oh, I think you can. And you know, I, I thought to share with you was about Ivan Meisner, who founded BNI. Um, I just did a clubhouse. If you don't know what clubhouse is, it's yeah. a new billion dollar valuation audio only. So you don't have to wear makeup and comb your hair. <laughs> uh, nice little feature. Yeah. And I invited Ivan because he's a buddy of mine. And I watched this happen in real time, or I heard it happen. Uh -huh. One of the women was saying, oh, I... I have so much social media, I can't even handle it all. And Ivan just naturally piped up and said, you know, I really don't do, he even admitted, I don't even know how to pay you on this. I have people that help me. And he says, I have a wonderful person. It's their business. He said, um, I'm afraid you're going to have to email me because he didn't know how to do that. He yeah. said, and I will recommend someone who could do that for you. Look at that. So I think that's been one of BNI, Business Networking International. Yeah. It, it's really, it, I, here's what I consider it. Networking is a lifestyle, not a work style. Mm -hmm. If you think today I'm going to network business and get myself some leads and leverage my silos, whatever that means, mm -hmm. you're wrong. Yeah. It's really about, do you think of yourself as a giver, are you generous? And I don't mean, do you give money? Though that would be nice. What I mean is, do you give time? Do you give support? Do you give leads? Do you give information? And I think, I think Ivan has helped structure BNI so that people who like yourself are not, or like my ex, aren't inclined to do that, more inclined. But I'm gonna say something that may ruffle a few feathers. I have never met anyone who disliked networking, who was the recipient of good referrals. Oh, they love networking if they get a lead that turns into a $50,000 client or speaking gig. 
So when they say I don't like networking, they actually love networking. What they don't like is the networking part. <laughs> it is work. It's yeah. an effort. Yeah. That's a, one of my favorite um, uh, Edison quotes. I'll see if I can remember it now is um, most people avoid uh, uh, opportunity because it's most people miss out on opportunity because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. And I've always loved that quote, even though I'm a believer in smart work and not hard work. I love that quote because the idea of like, by the way, you might have to do a little something uh, involved with it. And I love this distinction that you're making between networking, which for a lot of people like activates their I'm shy and I, it makes me feel needy and all of these crazy things that go along with it. If you can just think of it as like going out there and, and making friends with your people in the room and, you know, discovering new people who might be your people, just taking that activity. And then there is the different part of this, which is following up on all that stuff. So can you talk for a minute about like, what's the, what goes into that? After I leave with those business cards in my hand and they don't go to the dry cleaners, what do I do with them? Well, the, first of all, I want, I'm glad you just said that. Have business cards. I can't tell you how many people here in the Silicon Valley have said to me, oh, I haven't had business cards in eight years. You're bragging. So let's just say I'm a VC person and I need a card because I'm visual uh -huh. and tactile because I want to hold it. I want to look at it. And you go, oh, I'm sorry. Here's my pet peeve. Uh, oh, let me take a picture and you can look me up on LinkedIn. I mm -hmm. actually was the first woman keynote at a at LinkedIn itself here for the woman, women engineers in tech. And afterwards, I was talking to a woman who I thought was one of my people. And I said, oh, do you have a card? And she looked at me and she said, oh, no, uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn. And I have used this story mm -hmm. for the last years in every keynote because my line to that is really you just gave me homework <laughs> I'm so glad you call it that that's what I say to people all the time is do not give someone a task don't give them homework what I would have said and I don't know if you would also d dislike this is let me find you real quick and add you on my LinkedIn um I think adding people to LinkedIn is all all well and good but a lot of people do that and then you never hear from them again. Well, they that's, don't know well, that's they the, you've got to plug the vacuum cleaner in and push it around. So they've plugged I, it in, but then they didn't do the part two of it. That's what I just did this morning. Thank you. And that's like, because I've been staring at it and I go, it's not doing the work. Oh, <laughs> got to plug it in and move it. <laughs> you didn't have to push it. Here, let's give the definition of work. Work is defined as the expenditure of energy. And if you're going to go online into a Zoom or a WebEx, if you're going to go into any room, if you're going to, even at the grocery store, that's a room, you are expending energy. So don't go anywhere that you don't bring your energy, your spirit, your smile. When I do my keynotes, people will say, oh, this is what made it okay to go over to this person they smiled mm -hmm. and and i'm going to jump on what you said about people are shy and we now have the new group that says that they're introverts and they all hide behind this so i'm going to give another susan Rowan, don't do this don't label other people and don't self-label the minute we say i am too tired we feel exhausted mm -hmm. the minute we say I'm shy, you stand in the corner. The minute we say, you know, I, I'm not worthy. I don't know why I've been watching that commercial a lot you know, mm -hmm. that Mike Myers and yeah. Dana Carvey have been doing. You are worthy. And I think that's the thing in networking. People think, oh, I don't want people to think I'm needy. Well, guess what? We all need you. We all have different skills. And if you, for one minute, think you don't have skills, and then you sit there and fix a computer and fix a toilet and cut your own hair and change the oil in your car and you can code, and I'm sitting there going, I can't do any of that. What I want everyone to do, and I want you to do it with pen and paper. Now, or you could use pencil, but it has to be where you're using motor skills because this is how we remember. This is homework. I'm sorry, Samantha. Every <laughs> homework time is okay. <laughs> you, 
you every time you hear someone say something that sounds like a compliment, oh, that's really good. That, oh, you did that? Write it down. I want you to keep a list because we don't know what we're good at until we hear other people say that. Second part, because we're not like having so many in-face interactions, in-person interactions. Did I mean in your face? I didn't mean that at all. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, what I also would like, and I've done this with a number of groups I've spoken to, and, and the responses have been so interesting. Ask people, tell them, Susan Rowan, who wrote How to Work Room and Secrets to Savvy Networking, gave me an assignment. I'm supposed to ask the people who I respect, see, throwing in that little compliment, that I respect and really like and trust what they think my two top skills are, or traits. Well, when you, first of all, when you say you like, respect, and trust them, they are going to rise to the occasion. You'd be so surprised. And I've had other clients, including the CEO of one division of a company. He said, I had no idea they thought that of me. So get, don't ask people what you need to improve. You know what? You already know what you need to improve. You, we, we look in mirrors and we see things and we go, I wish I could ask people, what are my two best traits, quality skills? Write it down. Super love it, super beautiful. I think that's uh, the kind of thing that uh, people might feel like they need to be especially brave to do. And I feel like just have a brave day and do that this week. And sometimes it's too scary face to face. And luckily almost nothing is face to face anymore. So um, I, I think that's a, a, a thing that you can do by phone or email or a, in, in a zoom or something, but I definitely think that's a, a great one to do. And I would start with uh, familiar people who are maybe kind of safer and easier to do that and then kind of expand and, and be braver with it. And when you invite someone to ask, uh, to answer that question, very often it makes them uh, brave enough to ask you the same thing. So I just love that, uh, that question. You know, here's, and this may sound like it has nothing to do with it, but the really, I thought about it when I was writing, what do I say next? You know how, when we talk to little kids, we are so engaged. You did that. You drew that all by yourself. Wow. You're a really talented artist. And then we grow up and this is how we talk to each other. That's lovely. My face isn't moving. So that lovely sounds like an insult. Yep. We need to embrace some of the joie de vivre that we engage with little kids and keep that oh wow factor in our voice, in our respect for other people's accomplishment and, and on our faces. Because Absolutely. even if you're not seeing people, if you're just talking to them, whether it's on Clubhouse or mm -hmm. on the phone, people can hear your joy. Definitely, I love that as well. Uh, Susan, you have such a generosity of spirit and I, it comes through in the expertise that you're sharing as well as in how, how you are being. And I really appreciate that. And I think it speaks to uh, what makes people successful when they're networking is uh, you know, an, an authentic desire to connect with others and that generosity. So I appreciate you bringing that to us. I want to just say this to everyone who's going on a Zoom. Here's Susan Rowan saying, when you get the invitation, look at your calendar don't wash your hair that day because, you know, we've used that as an excuse an awful lot. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to wash my hair that hour. <laughs> um, what you do is you look at your calendar and even if you'd like to say no, say yes. That was one of the traits when I was writing um, How to Create Your Own Luck, my You Never Know book. Mm -hmm. The people who created their own luck, they wanted to say no, but for some reason they said yes. And because that, they were in the room, they were in the relationship. They were able to be in a position to avail themselves of opportunities had they said no, would never have crossed their path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so think that's a really yes. great, it's a right, really great point. I have, um, you know, I'm a big fan of this shirt that says, I'm sorry, I'm late, I didn't want to come. And so I'm definitely a person who, who would rather not, uh, especially with live in-person events, um, 
And I do, I wouldn't say I force myself. I would say I invite myself to take advantage of in-person networking opportunities. And it, uh, I try to say yes to almost all of them. Uh, and I, I just wanted to get your take on this. One of my beliefs about networking, many marketing strategies are what I call would call farming. It's like you're planting seeds that will be recouped one day. So, you know, building your brand, um, doing a podcast like this one, these are things that kind of build your brand over time. And you know, you can have a pretty amazing farm, but you're not going to be eating out of that thing the first day. I've always called networking a grocery store. And when I lived in a place where I could go to frequent in-person events and did go to them often, if I was ever like, you know what, I kind of need some new clients. I would go to a networking event and I would leave with leads that quickly turned into clients. So I think of networking as like a grocery store. If you need clients right now, like go be visible and say yes to all those kinds of opportunities. In fact, it's so funny as I've been at it this a while, but before I even wrote How to Work a Room, I was teaching networking and I called it, and I even found it in a, a file. The program is called Visibility Marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah, because there's nothing more assuring to a person who might want to hire you yeah. than to see you in person and have, <laughs> a, and have a flavor of who you yeah. are and how yeah. you operate and how you speak and um, and whatever their gut level reaction is to, I, I be honest with you, my world is full of amazing people because I showed up, I went somewhere. Some of the people in my life who are more dear to me than anything are people that started as clients and quickly transitioned to dear friends. Uh, one of the women who read how to work a room called me and said, I think you have to work with my company. Um, and we did the event in San Francisco and she said, oh, I'm going to take the bus home at night. And I said, it's on my way to the bridge. I go, you're not taking the bus at night. Uh, my own value system, mm -hmm. but I was taught because my father always gave people lifts. But I said, would you come with me to Saks? I have to pick something up. She goes, oh, happily. Well, I saw another jacket I liked and she, <laughs> oh, you must have it. But she didn't pay for it. I did. But she actually, she did pay for it because she hired me. Mm -hmm. That was 23 years ago. I'm now Aunt Susan to her daughter. Oh, wow. So, you know, you don't know where things will go. And the one thing I would say that I, it's not my secret sauce because that makes it sound like business and that I cook, which I don't. <laughs> but one of the things I think about myself is when I meet good people. I have Velcro in my veins. I will make that extra phone call. I will check in. And, and this relates to networking. Back in the day, we only had the phone, a yeah. letter. We didn't even have a fax. Now you can ping someone. You can Instagram something to them. You can link in with them. You can Facebook, you can text, you can tweet so many options to stay connected. And I think we're so lucky to have those options. So if you, for, for people who are listening, who feel like I'm a really good networker, I'm a strong networker. What are your, rather than a, us talking about kind of some beginner tips, what are for people who are like, I'm great at networking. What are your tips for them to be like amazing over the top, even better? You know, there are a couple of the, it's what I consider the difference between savvy and those that aren't savvy. The savvy among us who are really great networkers, I might add, don't think that they're networking. They're just being. Mm -hmm. They instinctively do what is good manners, what is good follow-up. So mm -hmm. one tip, and it's a little bit of a pet peeve with me, the savvy networker thinks, oh, I can work in a room and I can turn people into clients. I say to people, what you make happen for yourself means nothing to me. The savvy networker makes things happen for other people. That's who is the really good networker. That's number one. The second thing is the savvy networker keeps people in the loop. It's not just I walk into a room, I meet people or I go somewhere and I could turn them into a big client. Who cares? The savvy network goes back to the person who made the introduction, goes mm -hmm. back to the person who makes the referral and said, hey, I just need to let you know. Uh, and I'm going to share this. We were introduced by a longtime friend, 
Susan Harrow. And once, Samantha, you and I had our wonderful, fun conversation, I sent her an email. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. We had such a great conversation and we booked a time. Because it would be, I think, rude, and I'm going to be judgmental, stupid of me <laughs> yeah. if I did not keep the matchmaker, the connector mm -hmm. in the loop. So that's one of the skills. It's like at a higher level. I think at so. The higher it's level people high know. Level. Yeah. The higher level people also instinctively know not only that they must acknowledge, but what is to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get a birthday present and it has a bow, thank you is not even up for discussion. Yeah. But the savvy person knows they got a lead. They got information they needed. They got some acknowledgement that really meant a lot to them. Mm -hmm. They got advice or they had an issue and they had someone who just listened and they came to their own conclusion and solution. But you know, when you have someone that listens to you and allows you to work things out, we usually pay them 250 an hour, 250. <laughs> so that person saved you money. The least yeah. you could do is say thank you. So I think this really savvy level person mm -hmm. knows what to do. And they also really instinctively know who to introduce to each other. Yeah. Well, that's when they, I think, uh, as we said, like some people are just born with that. And then I notice um, for me and for other people who are close to me, who I would call kind of maybe referral partners formally or inform informally, you know, you just know people who like know you well enough that they're like, ah, and they make connections. And uh, what is such a pleasure for me is, um, is the kind of connections that you were talking about of uh, like Ivan Meisner, like I know somebody who can help you with that, or, you know, I'm, I, I have a VA who is amazing and she might have an opening or th things like that. I, I love those kind of connections that just make your life easier. And of course that turns into more, I think everyone benefits more, whether it's literally profits or just lives more joyfully. And, and I, I want to underscore what you said. I think everyone is looking for more prof profits. The other part is, you can have a lot of profits and not live joyfully. And you really want, everyone says, oh, I, I ba balance, balance. Well, some days it's like a teeter-totter. Some yeah. days you're up here, some days you're down here. But if you live joyfully. So I, I'm i very um, specific. I cannot be with anyone that doesn't have a good sense of humor. Uh huh. It just doesn't work for me at all. And there have been some people I've met who don't, and I find, I don't know if you have literal knots in your stomach, but they <laughs> give me knots in my stomach. Um, on the other hand, sometimes that person is really funny, is really kind, is really interesting, knows a lot that you don't know, but is really painfully shy. So I am going to kind of not erase everything I said. I'm gonna give a caveat. Be, and this is, this is going to come out funny, be a two-timer. Mm -hmm. And that means give people a second chance. You don't know if they're nervous. You don't know if they found out that mother fell and may have to go into a nursing home. You don't know if the kid did bad on the SATs. People could be preoccupied. Give people a second chance. Now, do we give them a third chance if they're not yeah, well, this isn't baseball. Three yeah. strikes and you're out. You know, but, but, and this is what I learned from the people who created their own luck. They didn't burn bridges. Oh, you're speaking my language. <laughs> they did not burn bridges. And I have the story of someone who was at, she did the choreography and she did not burn a bridge and it allowed her to walk back and then be the choreographer for them. So try not to burn bridges. And, yeah. and it's, I'm gonna just kind of quote all of our grandmothers who all said this to us, you ne never know. We don't know who's gonna show up in second part of second decade. Mm -hmm. And this is a network, this is a, okay, this is a story was told to me by a client 
who at the time was at Pac Bell, and she didn't have a, a big title. Her title was director. And two people that wanted to do work with Pacific Bell saw her title on her name tag at an event. So they just scurried off to go to talk to someone that said vice president mm -hmm. on the title. And they had the proposal. Uh -huh. And what you never know is what a company does with their titles, because she was in charge of this whole division. They walked into the room of the woman they had walked away from mm -hmm. to make their proposal. Mm -hmm. She didn't forget them. <laughs> yeah. Guess who didn't get the contract? Mm -hmm. So don't miss, don't mistake that every, almost every bank hands out vice president titles a dime a dozen, but other companies might not. You need to have a conversation to find it. Yeah. Out. And by the way, please don't go anywhere on zoom or in an in-person room and make one of your first three questions. What do you do? <laughs> so what are the first three questions? Okay. The first one should be an observation. And, and this is how we make conversation. Observe, ask, and reveal. Conversation is a trifecta. It's those three traits together. If you're always asking questions, you're the grand and not so grand inquisitor. I mean, by the way, when someone asks me a lot of questions, it brings out my Chicago. I give them four questions for tradition's sake. And then the fifth question where they've added nothing, I look at them and I don't know if I say it, though I think I might have. What's it to you? <laughs> Why are you grilling me? Do I look like a piece of steak? You know, I, really. Mm -hmm. Who, it was Dale Carnegie that said, ask people a lot of questions so they can talk about themselves, their favorite subject. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Maybe not so many. <laughs> That's not a conversation. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What you do is you have to bring yourself into the room because people want to know they're talking to a person, not a 20 question expert <laughs> yeah oh cool. bot oh i like that <laughs> one of those good. bots been programmed so, that, that's some of my thoughts <laughs> uh so susan you have been in business for 40 years is this this month or in january no it's this year this year and, and i'm celebrating all year good and it's um it started in june and 40 years since I walked into the San Francisco City Hall and filed my business papers. Wow. But I'm a former teacher and they had uh -huh. teacher layoffs. So when he's, this guy said to me, as I was filling out the forms, he said, you know, when you make your first $250,000, you're going to have to pay sales tax. He said it to a teacher, 250,000. We don't make in like, you have to like live in Tenure. three different life. I looked at him and said, from your mouth to God's ears, I'd be happy to pay taxes. <laughs> right, this was exactly. Hope so. And the guy went, yeah, that's what, that, uh, that would be my goal. Yeah. But it's been an interesting odyssey, if not an odd odyssey, mm -hmm. because the business started. And I want to say this for people that have had this experience, because I was laid off from teaching when they massively laid off 1,200 teachers. Mm -hmm. But I turned it into a career change workshop for teachers. Mm -hmm. And then I had 100 people on a waiting list. It's too long of a story to tell. And my, and I want you to remember this word, Sally Livingston, my femtor. Now I called her my mentor and she said, how can I be your mentor? I'm your femtor. Nice. And she said to me, my dear girl, you have a hundred people on a waiting list. You have a business. Come with me Monday night to women entrepreneurs to hear the fabulous Patricia Fripp speak. And you know, it didn't matter what plans I had when someone you admire, trust, respect, and adore says that you change your calendar. And I went that Monday night and I'm pleased to say over 40 years, Fripp and I are now best of friends, oh. but it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. So when you get good advice from people that sound good, that your gut says, hmm, I think she must be right. Do it. Love that. Uh, is there anything that you wish you knew 40 years ago that you're uh, glad that you know now? 
Have people around you who have good BS detectors. So when someone says, if you pay me 10,000 a month, I'll make you a best-selling author overnight. I'm going, I have been a best-selling author. Trust me, it don't happen overnight. <laughs> right. You know, I, I want people to be able to see through the people that are nothing more than snake oil salespeople. Mm -hmm. And the people that tell you you should do things, have at least three people from different parts of your life as your kitchen cabinet that you trust, that you know love and adore you and want you to succeed. They may not be colleagues. They might be, like for me, one of your best friends from high school who ended up being a CEO. Mm -hmm. um, one of my sorority sisters who ended up being the um, accountant CPA for mid-sized businesses that she shared their goals. Have people who, who care about you and it's nothing in it for them as to whatever you do. No, mm -hmm. no silver will cross a palm. Mm -hmm. Does that sound skeptical? It doesn't sound skeptical at all. It sounds like reality. And um, I think it never hurts to be, to be reminded that you need to have people around you that you can really um, trust and turn to. Uh, Seth Godin was on a podcast recently and just talked about um, making sure you get feedback from people who uh, know what they're talking about so that you don't get discouraging feedback from someone just because they have no idea what the realm is. Right. And I, and you know, Seth Godin used to write, I think it was either for Fast, I think it was Fast Company. Fast Company. And he wrote something years ago about his mother who was a volunteer and what she did. And I thought he was writing about my mother <laughs> who after my brother had polio, my mother worked with a lot of people in Chicago to coordinate the first mother's march, the March of Dimes. Mm -hmm. And I saw someone who really was the volunteer and what they did. And we went door to door and we raised money. And then there was the vaccine. Well, my brother already had polio. My mother could have said, I have other things to do, but she said she did not want any family or any child or adult to go through what we went through. So I also learned from that, that I have to be present. But I wrote Seth Godin and say, I thought you were writing about my mother. And he wow. wrote me back. And I had the pleasure of meeting. We were both on a, a program together um, and he actually endorsed, uh, I think, the third version of How to Work a Room. And and he he is a different thinker. And he was on, was he on the Sunday morning show or 60 Minutes? And he was wearing different socks. So I wrote him an email, but I <laughs> love this endorsement. And people respond. So I'm going to give people another hint. If you see something or hear something you like, let that person know. Um speak up. You think, well, no, they won't care. Do you have any idea how many tweets I've sent to Bette Midler? I mean, she says the, she sends the funniest tweets. I'm sure she wants to hear from me. For people that I respect, Michael Bushloss, um, um, Lawrence Tribe, um, uh, let people know. Mm -hmm. But we also can't just do it for the people in business. We must bring that to our personal lives. We must let people know. I just need to let you know that because of you saying this to me, I went out and did this. I want you to see the picture of it. The more we can let people know what they mean to you, what they did, how it impacted you, that's how we grow relationships. Absolutely. And that's also, I think, how more of those wonderful things happen. You're, you're nurturing the cycle of those things. Susan, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. I know that uh, you are available as a virtual speaker. You have, um, obviously, we'll, we'll put in the show notes uh, your books so uh, people can go and find those. Um, and was there something uh, uh, else that you wanted us to, um, to mention today? No, but I would say this. If anyone watching, listening has a burning question, I want you, I'm going to give you my email. It'll be in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Don't let it give you heartburn. What you do is you email me and I learned this as a teacher. We will come up with a solution together. So Susan at Susan Rowan, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E.com. I do work with people individually. I do coach some authors. 
but primarily if you've got a question, we're going to figure out a solution. Awesome. So generous of you. And uh, so already I can tell on brand for you from what I've, what I've learned in just the short time I've known you, although I've known of you for a long time, because I, as I mentioned, how to work a room is essential in anyone's um, business library. And now that I've heard about the other ones, I clearly need to get those too. So Susan, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Your, your, everything you've shared is so uh, timely and relevant to today um, in being a good networker and just in being a good person. So I really appreciate that you shared that. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel and click the bell to get video updates. Thanks.